Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. Today we are joined by writer and commentator Coleman Hughes, um, down the line from Lower Manhattan. Hi, Coleman. So we've been really admiring your thoughtful contribution during this Black Lives Matter debate. Um, you've set out in lengthy and widely shared articles some of your skepticism around some of the kind of central tenets uh, of that movement. And I guess the, the, the most important one, the foundational one, is this idea of systemic or institutional or structural racism. Um, that's what people are protesting against. Do you think that structural racism exists in America? I find it to be a very imprecise and just difficult and vague concept. Um, I know at least one left-wing scholar on racism has criticized it because what is the system? You know, every, every, if we want to talk about incarceration, you know, 70 or 80% of, of prisoners are in state run facilities. Each one of those states has a different set of laws and a different way of running things. Um, you know, it, there's no one healthcare system and it, I tend to be very skeptical of claims that the system is broadly racist uh, because the evidence generally used to back that up are broad average disparities between groups in, say, health outcomes or income or wealth. Um, you know, if, if to me, the, the clearest evidence of racism is when a researcher sends out identical emails to a professor and gets a 70% hit rate if it's, if it's a black sounding name versus a 90% hit rate if it's a white sounding name. So is that systemic? I don't know. I, growing up, I would just understand that as ordinary racial, individual racial bias. Um, so that kind of thing is completely real and uh, must be opposed and condemned in the strongest possible terms. But if, we're, if we want to talk about whether, say, the prison system is racist, and you think it is because black people are 13% of the US population, but 33% of those in prison, that is a, a, a deep logical fallacy. It doesn't account for the fact that different groups have different patterns of behavior, different cultures at the average, different demographic characteristics, different geographical spreads. It's um, extraordinarily unrigorous. And that's the, you know, what, when called upon to prove the systemic racism claim, that is what people tend to jump to first. And I, I think, I, I don't think that's uh, that's rigorous okay. at all. So on the specific point of the prison system, do you think the evidence is there that it is racist? What I can say is this. When you can look at it two ways. You can say when white people and black people get convicted of the same crime and hold everything constant, uh, do black people get longer sentences and by how much? Um, there's a lot of studies like that that have been done and they find that there is a statistically significant difference that you hold everything constant and it still seems like Black people are getting sent to jail for a bit longer, um, a bit more likely to be prosecuted to begin with, and so on and so forth. Uh, so racial bias can look very big when you look at it that way. But you can also look at it from the reverse way, which is to say, look at the overall disparity in, say, white people and black people going to prison. It's, uh, it's huge. It's, I'm not, I can't recall exactly what it is, but it might be something like sevenfold. Um, how much of that disparity in percentage terms is due to the racial bias and how much is due to the underlying fact of racially disparate crime and when those studies are done it's found that you know the the amount that is caused by racial bias which is to say if we could wave a magic wand and get rid of all the bias that we we have reason to believe exists based on research the disparity might shrink by 10 percent and we would still be left with the overwhelming fact of racial disparity in commission of crimes and that would be a very difficult problem to talk about much less solve that's not to say there's no racism it's just to say that racism is sometimes one of 50 elements that are contributing to uh, a racial disparity on the the central um, question that the black lives matter protest kind of hangs on um, which is police brutality um, what's your understanding of the evidence there is there are is police violence disproportionately and unfairly directed towards black people? So um, I would separate a few issues. There's one, deadly shootings. And there is broader contact with police in general. On deadly shootings, there's you know, lots of rigorous studies that 
have simply found no bias in the police's likelihood to pull the trigger between black and white. If we're talking, though, about the police, a policeman's likelihood to go hands on a suspect, holding everything else about the encounter equal. So far, there is pretty strong evidence that the police are around 20 percent more likely to put their hands on a suspect who is black or Hispanic relative to a white suspect under similar circumstances. Me being rough with them or punching them or that kind of. Yeah. Any any use of force up to lethal from mild arrest to to beating to a baton to tasing. So, um, again, the, the, it's 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 difficult. I'm always wary of you know trusting one research paper, and it, it's actually a very difficult issue to research mm-hmm. in general. But you know, if we step back and and don't pretend that we anyone knows exactly how much racism there is, there is some. Um, you know, we have a a difficult situation, which is that in many cities, in there are cities in America where over ninety percent of shootings are committed by by black and Hispanic people. There are cities where seventy and eighty percent are committed just by black people. What what are the police to do in a situation like this? Are the police to pretend that there are no patterns racially and therefore forsake the very communities? that you know most of whom are completely law abiding that very much crave protection the ones making the 911 calls are are also black people right or do they do they risk going overboard and racial profiling and understandably you know making a whole generation of young black men resentful of the increased police attention that they're receiving by no fault of their own so how far away from getting that balance right do you think they are I mean, how bad is the problem? Well, I think we have seen examples where it goes too far on both ends and like sometimes at the same time. So for example, stop and frisk in New York, I would consider an example where the police went completely overboard. There's a whole generation of of black and Hispanic boys in New York that were humiliated, stopped and frisked, um, you know, for marijuana, which honestly, nobody cares about or sh- and nobody should care about, you know, pinned up against a wall and embittered in their attitudes t- towards the police, probably for a lifetime, um, all in the name of saving a few lives. And sure, maybe it did save a few lives. But, you know, as a as a as a policy person, you can't simply optimize for the lowest number of lives lost lost without, you know, taking on board the the long-term consequences of like, are you destroying trust with between the police in a particular community and how many lives will that cost in the long run? So stop and frisk would be an example of an overreach in one direction. At the same time, there's a great paper by uh, Harvard economist, Roland Fryer called policing the police, where he looks at instances where the justice department has investigated local police departments to determine how much racism there is, especially following events where a shooting is caught on viral video. And he's found that in that circumstance, when there's a viral video and an investigation of the police, homicides go up drastically. We saw this in Baltimore after Freddie Gray. Crime went up in the in the in the prece- in, in the in the following month to an incredible degree. Crime has gone up in New York to an incredible degree in the past month um, in Chicago. So when the police back off, that can also very much have consequences. So. I'm not saying I know the correct balance. I think I can spot the overreaches, but I think it is just worth admitting that this is a situation that does have some inherent trade-offs and we have to strike that balance. So when we look at the Black Lives Matter protest, which has not only totally um, captivated uh, the United States, but has also spilled out uh, internationally and there are kind of sympathetic movements across the world. Do you think that the, um, the, the protest is proportional to the problem? No, I I don't. Um, Okay, so then I have to say how big is the problem and how big is the, we we know how big the protest is, it's global. How big is the problem? Um, One way of measuring it is in terms of lives lost. Uh, You know, 55 unarmed Americans killed by the police last year. I believe 19 of them were black, 19 out of 55, 19 total. 
Um, more of them were white. Uh, some of them were Hispanic and very few of them were Asian. So, you know, right off the bat, 55 people in a year, I, you know, I understand that, you know, body count is not the only thing that matters, but it is a thing that matters. Um, you know, I remember it seems like a long time ago, but it was just a few years ago where, you know, the threat of, of jihadist terrorism was very pressing, particularly in Europe, but also in America. And some people were too concerned about it. Um, they feared a terrorist attack when they were going to the supermarket. And it was part of the media's responsibility at that time, at least in the States where, where the threat was m less pronounced to say, actually, this kills like 20 or 30 people a year in America. And you're as likely to die of a lightning strike. And I think that was viewed as an important check on the degree to which people tend to freak out about things. There is nobody doing that with this issue in America. There are very few people that are willing to say right now, 55 is, is on the order of bee stings and lightning strikes. And if you're a black man, you should not fear for your life. Uh, you should obviously understand that if you're in an encounter with a police, policeman, that there are things you can do to, to um, you know, there, there are best practices as someone being arrested, obviously not resisting, but the way you talk, keeping your hands on the steering, steering wheel and so forth, the things that many black parents and frankly, non-black parents teach their kids. But I, I don't see how it's a, it's the kind of issue that should inspire global protest. And, um, and, and finally, I think the reason it has is because we now have social media. I, I don't think it's an accident that black, you know, BLM began in 2013, which is the same year that everyone and their parents were on Facebook and had smartphones for the first time, which means that even a problem that happens that has a one in a billion chance of happening to any given person on any given day in America, because it's such a large country and a smartphone country, you know, it'll happen a couple times a week to somebody somewhere and somebody will film it. And you can create a narrative that this kind of thing is rampant by selectively choosing what to elevate in people's news feeds, even if the problem is objectively getting better on the whole. So I think that's why we're seeing so much energy about this right now. Um, so have you had conversations with, with, I mean, you must have done with, uh, you're arguing on the other side with either colleagues or students or friends um, and they're white and you are mm -hmm. sort of, and they are in some way saying that you don't understand the racial issue as well as they do. That, that sure. must have happened. Many, many times. Um, what is going on in that scenario? What, what, when you see those people, the, 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 the white majority uh, that have become so um, kind of focused on this. What, what do you think is, is going on with them? What, why is that happening? Um, I think, you know, part of it is, is what I mentioned earlier, the, the way in which the media has uh, given a very biased account of what's gone on in the last seven or eight years. Um, there's lots of white people that have gotten killed by the police on video, and I don't think anyone knows their names. I know their names because I've researched it, but the typical person doesn't know their name because it doesn't get into your newsfeed. Um, for listeners, look up Tony Timpa, Daniel Shaver, Dylan Noble, for starters. So there's that, the false perception that overwhelmingly it's black people getting killed by the police. And secondly, there's, there's a kind of psychology of guilt that is very powerful that animates a lot of the way white liberals think and feel about this issue. Um, a lot of white people they, you know, they come from re relatively advantaged suburbs or, or, or city areas, and they look on the news, they see what it looks like to live in, live in the projects. They see, you know, a whole apartment buildings, public housing filled with black people that are living in a, a in what is relative to them, a, an extremely deep poverty. And they understandably think, what the hell is going on? Like, what, what is it? And, and the narrative on offer, the biggest narrative on offer that's, you know, increasingly swept colleges is that in some way, shape or form, you are to blame or your ancestors are to blame or at minimum, you are complicit in a system that was built for people like you to succeed. And that is the reason. That's the 
the arrow of causation starts there and ends with the killing of George Floyd, for example. And so that event becomes symbolic of your complicitness. And it activates a, an entire psychology of guilt that is enormously meaningful to people. It creates what I imagine is a similar sensation to the feeling of original sin and the notion that Christ's blood is, is on your hands. There is some part of the human mind that craves that feeling. And that feeling is being provided by modern anti-racism to many white people. So do you think that the protests in some will make racial tension better or worse? I mean, I, I can see some costs and some benefits. The benefits, I think there's a certain type of person who is too quick to call the cops on the black person walking into their neighborhood. That's a real thing. And because of BLM and the current mood, I think that person is more likely to think twice and say, is it worth calling the cops for this? I think that's a, uh, on balance, that's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, I think... So not if they've been feeling unsafe because there's been riots in their city, then they're probably more likely to call the cops, at least in the short right. term. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So the riots appear to have died down for the most part. But yeah, your, your, your point is well taken. Um, on the other hand, I think people are more paranoid about the race issue than they've been at any point in recent history, you know, like... What is it like for a white stranger to interact with a black stranger right now? Is the white person thinking, oh, this, this, what if this person assumes I'm a racist? Um, you know, what can I say? Are, are they going to feel condescended to if I bend over backwards to show I'm not racist? Um, the black person is thinking, you know, what, what does this person think of me? Do they think I'm playing the race card too much? Are, are they afraid of me playing the race card? Do they want me to play the race card? Are they a guilty white liberal that wants me to flagellate them? Or are they a white conservative that's going to be pissed off if I even complain about a real incident of racism? And all of that, like, psychological, that all of that psychodrama is, is like, amplified now. So I, I, you know, I worry about the prospect of, like, interracial friendships forming and interracial relationships. I think that friction is, has to be higher now than it's been at any time in recent history. Which actually is the opposite of that famous Martin Luther King quote about being judged by the content of your character, not by the color of your skin. If, if there's so much emphasis on the color of people's skin, it makes it more of an issue. Yes, it does. It's very, I think, you know, what anti-racism meant in the early 60s when the great triumphs of the civil, ra uh, civil rights movement were uh, being, you know, being made, the meaning of anti-racism today has changed entirely. Um, it's not, it's no longer about it's no longer about contrasting racism with the ultimate superficiality of skin color. It's no longer about the ethos that, that race is only skin deep and what matters. You know, the reason racism is wrong is because we are all of the same species. And what is this? This is nothing. Um, Anti-racism today means this is everything. This is everything. And people with your skin color have oppressed me me not just my group but like in some in some deep sense me for hundreds of years and i need you to recognize that um how how, how the meat how how the color of your skin is injected with meaning by the his by the history of colonialism and white supremacy and so forth it's a very different ethos i think it's much more dangerous um you know in the in the 60s martin luther king said he, he famously dreamed about black kids and white kids holding hands and a couple of years ago in the New York Times, there was an op-ed published called Can My Children Be Friends with White People, published by a black author. It's just like the exact so it's re a, rebuttal of yeah, reversal. So it is a case people. then of actually going backwards in, in some respect then, in, in kind of with virtuous ends and in with kind of progressive goals, uh, which is to redress imbalances. Um, you end up by you know, putting emphasis on things that we were beginning to move past. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's how I see it. I, I do think it is a regression. It's a regression into tribalism. It, it's, not this, it's not exactly the same as the old style of racism. And I, I don't want to make too much of the equivalency because it's not as if they're saying that black people are genetically superior, and yada, yada, yada. But it is a regression into a tribe-based view of the world where there is some meaningful and and permanent fence between 
for example, you and I, because you look that way and I look this way. A quote from your um, long piece that you did recently that I just wanted to read out and ask you to elaborate on a little bit. Um, you said, I would submit that if this new anti-racist bias is justified, if we now have a moral obligation to care more about certain lives than others based on skin color or based on racial historical blood guilt, then everything that I thought I knew about basic morality and everything that the world's philosophical and religious tra traditions have been saying about common humanity, revenge and forgiveness since antiquity should be thrown out the window. Mm. Um, that really stuck with me and that's, that's a big statement. Um, and I just wondered if you could elaborate on that for us. Sure. The, the founding premise of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, their first argument in, in self-defense when attacked for being divisive was that the slogan Black Lives Matter is necessary because we are trying to correct the prevailing attitude that black lives don't matter. The status quo, they said, is that people only care when the victim is white. And we're here to correct that. And that's why you can't say all lives matter. That's why it's black lives matter. That was what they said. Now, eight years have passed. Um, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of Americans have been killed by the cops. Most of them have been white, or rather, the largest racial population among those killed unarmed has been white. And nobody I know knows a single one of those names. But here are the names they do know. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Alton Sterling, um, Walter Scott, Michael Brown, um, Sandra Bland. So what has this proved? From what I can see, the emperor has, this is an emperor has no clothes moment. America only cares when the victim is black now. That has not been true for most of American history. Of course, for most of American history, the, the, the bias has been a very anti-black racist one. But people, some people have trouble seeing a new situation when they're in one. No one knows the name Tony Timpa or Daniel Shaver. No one cares to know for whatever reason. And... And so Black Lives Matter has ended up disproving, in their, by their very success, they have ended up disproving they are, their fundamental premise, their foundational um, idea of self-defense. And, and fine, you might say, okay, there's a little bit of an overcorrection. But as I said, if, if an overcorrection is, if that is the morally proper route to take, then we, we should throw out every bit of basic morality that got us here to begin with. In which case, you know, the, the question is, how do we respond to it? You know, I've got loads of friends in America. I used to live there. Um, they're all almost to a, the last person are swept up in this and they've been on protests and they're posting black squares on Instagram and all the rest of it. And, you know, I am, will not sort of question it, I don't think, because, you know, the phrase Black Lives Matter is obviously very well chosen because it's impossible to disagree with. Um, you know, you very quickly risk being cast as either a kind of annoying contrarian or worse, an actual racist, if you start even kind of having the kind of conversation we're having. Um, so, so how do you think we should respond to these protests? Who is we? Well, <laughs> um, I mean, you're responding by uh -huh. talking very eloquently about it and writing mm -hmm. um, widely shared data rich articles about it, which make uh -huh. people better informed. So uh -huh. you know, that seems like a good response, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, uh, it, for ordinary people um, who aren't in that position, mm -hmm. um, who are just in amongst their friends, and you know, mm -hmm. they, how do you think? They should respond. Do you think it's something uh, that should actually be pushed back against, and that, that we need to find a sort of uh, arguments and, la and a language to kind of, you know, make a virtue of pushing back against it, or do you think it's just a question of, well, you know, I don't happen to see it that way, but I'll keep quiet about it. I, you know, it's it's easy. It's too easy to say I should. I think you should always push back when you can. I do think that because if you, if you, uh, you know. This is this happens all over the world and all throughout history, where you know a lot of people are skeptical of some, you know, flavor of the moment idea, but they all stay silent 
and therefore feel like they're in a, a, a tiny minority. Uh, and this is how movements get more power relative to the actual number of people that agree with those movements. Uh, it doesn't take 40% of society to change a whole society. It can be 5% if, if 95% are, you know, reticent. Um, so on that level, I think it's absolutely, absolutely imperative for, you know, the average Joe without a public platform when he is talking to his or her friends to, to be as honest as possible, be open-minded, of course, in arguments and like always acknowledge what you agree with about what someone said before you, you know, give your reasons for doubting. But, you know, you, you, you stay silent in the beginning and then, um, and then you're forced to stay silent because the, 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 the battle has been lost forever. I guess the difficulty is the shortage of kind of off the shelf moral arguments for people on that side to make. I mean, if a young person feels innately skeptical about an overly racialized view of the world, um, what moral argument should they make against it? Um, there is the, the principle that inspired the entire civil rights movement the anti-slavery movement, um, which is the principle that says all human beings are equal and race does not determine anything of deep value about who you are. I've never heard, you know, outside of frank racial supremacy, there are no, you know, major philosophical schools of thought or major religions that teach that Really, your race does make you different. Um, you you shouldn't necessarily embrace other folks of folks of other races or groups. You know, all of the great religious and and moral traditions from the past two thousand years of human history have taught one thing, among many others, but that we are all the same. Whether they say it's because we're in God's image or or, or for whatever reason, that is the ethic that has that. You know. I suppose you could say developed or Western societies are built on. It's the ethic. It's an ethic that was violated egregious, egregiously um, all throughout history. But it, it was a, a a kind of north star that guided, hmm. you know, the entire civil rights movement. I mean, and if we're going to abandon that, then we have some very serious reckoning to do. Would they not counter that? If I if I say that in a discussion, they'll say, well, yeah. Everyone is equal, but they're not getting equal treatment. Um, and so the reason we need to shout about it, the reason we need to draw attention to it, is to get closer to that dream of equality uh, that, as you say, has been the goal for hundreds of years. Um, and they just feel like they want to go further. They want to enforce equality or they want to target inequality as, as they see it. So what do you, if, if they come back at you with that, what do you say next? Well, I guess what I say is I don't see I don't see a lot of eagerness to treat people the same coming out of the far left at least. I see basically any policy that says we're going to treat black people better because in order to compensate for their historical uh disadvantages is applauded. And there's no sign that it's going to end at some point. It's not, it's not the desire to treat people the same. It's the, the desire to treat people in the reverse of how they've been treated historically so as to somehow compensate for hundreds of years of white supremacy. Um, that's not equal treatment. That's, that's, that's a, 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 an attempt to balance the scales of history, does which is mean, not possible. <laughs> does that mean you're against... Um, you know, what, I'm not sure we sometimes call it positive discrimination. That's probably not the right phrase. Um, you know, affirmative action, I think. Um, are you against any form of affirmative action? So, for example, if you've got two uh, CVs, two applications for a prestigious scholarship, and one of them is African-American and one of them is white, um, do you consider that? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly against race-based affirmative action. Um, if you, if we were going to talk about income based or some kind of measure of disadvantage, I would be pretty open to having that style of affirmative action. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
race is a is 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 a poor proxy for disadvantage at this point. You know, if if I benefited from affirmative action, you know, in my life, or you know, or black people like me from my income, you know, stratum. How how is that? I don't really understand how that's justice. I mean, you know, half the kids at these Ivy League schools, the black kids are immigrants or or their children. They weren't descendants of American slavery. Uh, and of course, you know, they're walking into a system that is now to some degree rigged in their favor. And, you know, the 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 Asian students in New York City that are, are you know, live above a a dry cleaner and no, yes, it's a stereotype, but it's I, I've also seen it with my eyes. You know, it's much harder for them to get into school, and it's it's not obvious to me that there's any justifiable argument for that. How is that justice? You are now being very vocal on these issues from a. Uh, you don't describe yourself as a conservative, uh, and how, how, what word should we use to describe your? Uh sort of views on these issues. I mean, I don't think in terms of the the political labels, you know, I think uh, just like the word feminist, the word conservative, you ask 10 people, you get 10 different definitions. At least um, the emphasis you've put on keeping things in proportion, uh, not kind of just accepting all the tenets of the Black Lives Matter protests and stuff puts you in a kind of unusual bracket um, for someone of your age, certainly, and Race as well. Um, you know, how do you feel about that? Is that something you feel conscious of? Um, yeah, I'm definitely conscious of the the fact that I have the skin color I do means that it, it means that people are more willing to listen to me and not dismiss me immediately. If I were white, I think I would be more easily dismissible. Um, that is part of the dynamic that I wish to change, but it is a fact on the ground at the moment. Um, and it's worth pointing out that that's a, you know, like there is nothing that I'm, I'm advocating that, that there isn't a left wing version of, or that there's nothing about my style of thinking that is incompatible in some deep sense with, with being a liberal. You know, I, I always imagined myself as a liberal growing up and never consciously made a switch. I just, you know, I'm, I'm saying the same things that Bayard Rustin was saying in, you know, the seventies and he organized the March on Washington. You know, it's not, it's not so much that, that I feel I've changed in any, in any capacity, but you know, that, that is a kind of stereotyping, which is to say, if a white guy was saying what I was saying, that many people would stereotype him as a racist. Oh, white guy against affirmative action. Of course he's against affirmative action. He's privileged. He probably has some amount of disdain for black people. He doesn't understand the depth of historical injustice. And so he opposes affirmative action because he's white. But if a black guy opposes affirmative action, there's a pause and the ears perk up and they say, okay, maybe maybe I'll hear him out, even if I ultimately disagree with him. Um, that's a kind of stereotyping. That is a kind of racial stereotyping that if it were, if a black person was the victim of it, it would be instantly recognizable as a problematic behavior. Let's talk um, just as the kind of final section here a little bit about the politics because um, you said that you don't think of yourself on the kind of conservative liberal spectrum, especially I understand that, um, but this has become a very politicized issue. Um, how do you think this plays out politically? I mean, in, in American politics, who, who do you think is talking sensibly around these issues? Um, where where should we be hopeful? I, I haven't heard any big political figure speak sensibly sensibly about it. Um, I mean, certainly not Trump. He struggles to speak sensibly about anything. Um, but I, I also think he will probably benefit in the short term, at least, from the chaos and the apologetics for crime and rioting on the left. The imagery of having autonomous zones with no police is an absolute gift to a president that styles himself uh, the law and order president. Um, so it will probably benefit any law and order candidates in the short run. Who, will you, who do you want to, to do well in November? Uh, I, I plan to vote for Joe Biden unless something drastic happens. I don't find him inspiring, but I think he, he can beat Trump. He's incredibly boring, which is exactly how I want my presidents to be. 
Um, I don't like inspiring politicians. They, they, they make me nervous. Um, I think politicians should be competent, should have a few things that they want to fix, have a good head on their shoulders, and keep the train on the tracks. You don't think you're going to run for office at any point in the future? Not going to be that guy? No, 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 no. I would like to live a somewhat happy life. So no, I will not be a politician. Okay, well, you've given me a lot of hope anyway, <laughs> uh, by sharing your thoughts uh, and talking in such a calm and um, evidence-based and, and rational way. So thank you for that. Uh, that was Coleman Hughes um, talking to us about the Black Lives Matter movement and racial tensions in America and elsewhere. I um, hope you found it as interesting as we did. We will be back in a couple of days. Thanks.